for the uh, people out there in TV land. So today we're going to talk about classification engines. Up to this point, we've been looking at our data models as a way to predict things that are generally continuous variables. So what is the speed of a rocket a few seconds after it launches, which has been a classic example, produces blue dots and red lines or red dots and blue lines, whatever we program it to. Um, and we've looked at uh, similar kinds of things. Classification takes that idea not a step further, but it's looking at different types of data relationships. It's looking at things that can be classified as green or blue or cats and dogs and so forth. It's a fundamentally different modeling approach. Today we're going to look at a not a compromise, kind of a hybrid. It's, it's still going to be a regression model, but its purpose is to estimate the probability of an outcome from multiple input variables. If the probability is close to one, we declare it red. If it's close to zero, we declare it blue or cat or dog or, or whatever the classification is. So our brains do some things really well. So up there on the screen, for those of you that are still awake, uh, there are three images from left to right. So what is the middle image? A, a cat, okay. You did that in a fraction of a second. We can teach a computer to do that, sort of, um, but not nearly at that speed. What's the image on the right? And the image on the left, it looks like a bunch of people and some old guy playing guitar to the kids. He can't tell, but he does have a shirt on. It looks like he could use another shirt, though. Okay, so we have an image of a group of people, a cat, and a tree. We're quite competent at telling those things apart. And in many cases, we don't even have to have seen a prior image of the thing, and we can associate it. When we convert those images into something a computer can read, and I have software do that, I won't show it to you. I'm going to tell it to you, and you're just going to have to trust me. When that's converted to grayscale, so we take the color out, and so now it's 256 shades of gray, which would be the name of my novel if I ever wrote it. <laughs> we converted those to grayscale and showed them to a computer. The picture on the left and the picture on the right as far as the computer is concerned, look an awful lot like each other. We can even take mean values of the pixel map and variances, and we find that a cat is slightly different than a group of people in a tree, but a group of people in a tree to a computer look almost the same. That process is called classification. All of us in this room, we can classify a group of people, a cat, a tree, pretty darn easily. Um, and today we're going to discuss approaches on how we do that uh, with a computer. Or more importantly, this is why you shouldn't be afraid of the metaverse just yet. Um, once you have no money, there'll, there'll be no incentive for the AI to go try to steal your money. So it, it's all going to end up good. The last gentleman that just came in. Give me a second. Oh, shit. Not a chance. Gunner. Gunner, okay. Gunner Clouds. So let's take a look at uh, prediction machines first to introduce the idea of classification. So here we have a uh, picture of a prediction machine, and it takes some question, does some thinking, and pushes out an answer. And actually, the name of the image on my file system is, is Eat, Think, Poop. So that's the eat, think, poop uh, image. Um, computers don't actually really have an ability to think. They're, they're calculators. And they can do calculation really fast and fairly extensively. So to convert our eat, think, poop into a computer, we have some sort of input or stimulus, some process, we call them functions. You define them. You have function. It takes input, produces output, and we get an output. So for instance, the input, we could give it the input 3 by 4, and 
the processor has been taught to interpret that particular input is take the number 4 and add it to itself three times, and we get an output of 12. Or we call that multiplication just to uh, justify a second floor of our math building. Third floor would be division, fourth floor would be subtraction. I'm not sure that's how you'd order them, but... And then the uh, exponentiation floor is actually the root. Okay, so it's not particularly impressive, but we could even make our own Python function and give it the cryptic name, the 3 by 4 function, takes an input A and B and performs the arithmetic, returns a value. If we set A equal to 3 and B equal to 4, okay, that's, that's a, at this point, that's a super dumb code. Now let's imagine that we have a machine that converts kilometers to miles. So we put kilometers in, we have it calculate, we want to get miles out. But let's pretend that we are normal uh, Texas Tech college students and professors, and we have no idea what the relationship is, except that, well, kilometers is how the rest of the world measures things, and miles is how we do it in the morally superior United States of America and Liberia, the only two countries that still use it. Uh, there must be some linear relationship because it'd be really stupid for all the other human beings on the earth to say, hey, let's screw with the Americans. We'll make kilometers equal to one mile plus y to the three halves power. Maybe they'd do that. We don't know. So let's, let's stipulate that we know that the relationship between the two is linear. It means if we double the number in miles, we expect the equivalent distance in kilometers to also double. With that knowledge, um, that gives us a clue on what that mysterious calculation step would be. It needs to be of the form miles equals kilometers times some constant, where c is a constant, and we don't know what the c is yet. And the only other clues we have are a couple of examples of pairing kilometers you can tell I must have cut and paste those words because I spelled kilometers wrong. Uh, with, I spelled it as if I were um, an Englishman named, what's the guy's name, Tariq something. So I'm pretty sure I did copy it. We will acknowledge the original author <laughs> in the bottom shortly so as not to be a full-blooded cheater. Um, so we have a couple of observations. So we have one example that zero kilometers, lo and behold, is the same as zero miles. And we have a second one that 100 kilometers is approximately 62.137 miles. So we could use that to try to uh, determine what the uh, constant C is. There's two ways to do it. We could use arithmetic and try to figure out um, what value of uh, C we multiply kilometers by to get 62 miles, which would be the way engineers and any other smart person on the planet would do it. But if you're a computer scientist, any of you all in here? Oh, good. We can pick on them. Uh, and you don't know that. Let's just pull a constant out of our datum. And so we reach into our datum and root around and let's say our first constant is a half. 100 kilometers in, multiply by a half, 50 miles out. <clears throat> and now we have to decide, are we close enough to the correct value or not? And we measure the distance from the correct value in the way we have in our other parts of the class. We take the observations, we subtract off the model, and in this case we get a distance of 12.137, and we might say, yeah, that's not close enough. So then we can make another guess, and another guess. And we could do it truly randomly. We just have a random number generator. And eventually, certainly within our lifetimes, it would come up with a guess that is close enough to minimize the error that you're happy with it. You could stop and declare that the constant. Or we could go with a systematic approach. So first, let's make our kilometers to miles function. Nothing unusual there. Here's a test case. And it, oh, I guess I should actually go to the, I'm switching to the actual worksheet. I didn't realize I was in a, uh, now you can let me move. Yeah, microscopic real estate.
Oh, it's Eat, Sleep, Poop. It's the name of the uh, uh, image file. If you don't remember anything else, you'll remember that. That might be a good examination question for uh, Thursday. What's the name of the image file that generates this image? And that would give three, six, that would give nine of you a, a, a slight edge. I may do that just for the amount of complaining it would generate. I'm trying to get the left edge to go away, and it didn't want it to do that. <coughs> about my error message. Thank you. Is that still more or less viewable? I think you have to click that file screen. Pardon? Still doesn't fit. <laughs> but thank you. We'll have to go with that. Um, so let's run all the stuff and then work our way down. Cats, dogs, our three by four function worked. Our kilometers to mile function works. <clears throat> and the important thing here is the estimation error that's being reported back. So now that we know there's an error, um, we then want to look at a way to adjust the value of the constant. In this case, we're short by 12 units. Um, we know that increasing the value of the constant will increase the output, so let's just move it from 0.5 to 0.6. It's still just a flat-out guess, not systematic. And we do that, and we run it with C of 0.6. Now our error has gone from 12 to 2, and the important point here, without going any further detail, is that from the value of error from the truth set, or the training set, we use that to change the value of C, and we stop when we have a value of C that makes the error small enough, acceptable enough. So how close is acceptable enough in miles and kilometers? I suppose it depends on whether you're driving a motorcycle, a car, or dispensing a thermonuclear hand grenade. Um, each of those will have a different uh, requirement of closeness. In the case of cars, if it's one of those autonomous cars that you, the human being, can't control, I, th I think we want it to be really close, close enough to uh, miss a pedestrian, at least if you're driving through a wealthy and powerful neighborhood. You don't want to hit those folks. You don't have enough money. They'll harvest your organs to get even in the lawsuit. Okay, so that was a grisly thing. <laughs> I don't know where the heck that came from. Um, so I lifted this from uh, this gentleman, Tariq Rashid, on page 16, and that's why you can see the English spelling of some words there. We go to point 7. Our error is now bigger than 2, and it's changed sign. And so that information can be used uh, to narrow in the estimates, I'll let you read that on your own time. And now we went back to uh, 0 0.65. And if some point, if we get lucky enough and we guess point, uh, 0 0.625, we now get our error to uh, 3 tenths of a mile, which is still a pretty big error when we're talking about self-piloting vehicles. Um, but that's really close when you're talking about nuclear hand grenades. Okay, so that was a prediction engine, and we can extend that to more than just two observations. We can have thousands, and we can come up with the uh, constant estimation by a variety of techniques. The one we've seen so far is not progressive, regressive. Yeah, regression. So now let's look total change in mindset. Now we're going to look at classification. So the this simple machine we just uh, introduced would be called a prediction engine because it takes input and it predicts what the output should be. 
And we refine that prediction by adjusting an internal parameter. In the case of miles and kilometers, the, uh, the adjustment constant. And then from the error with the truth set, we use that to adjust that internal parameter until we got close enough. Um, the important thing is close enough. Don't One should not leave here thinking that zero is close enough. That would be awesome. But that's pretty unrealistic. But close enough in the context of what you need the prediction engine to do. Hence the morbid jokes about nuclear hand grenades and self-driving vehicles. That, that wasn't completely out of my uh, datum. But now let's look at something different. Let's suppose we had a collection of observations of bugs out of a garden. And we measured two features, how long the bug is and how wide it is. And if we plot that, and we've done it with enough bugs, we might discover that caterpillars are kind of long, but sort of skinny. Whereas ladybirds, again, this is uh, British speak, we know that as a ladybug, um, are roughly square. They're about the same length as they are wide. So presumably we could measure an unknown bug because we're not a human being, we're a computer, and from that determine whether that bug belongs to the class of ladybugs or the class of caterpillars. So if we were able to plot it, I mean you can see there's these two clusters of measurements and they've done us a favor by coloring them green. Um, Imagine what would happen if we threw a straight line in here. We could draw a line like right there where the cursor is going back and forth. And clearly, if you're above that line, what kind of critters do we have? And if we're below the line, ladybug. If we had a line that was steeper and cut right through the caterpillar blob, that's not very useful. So with a classifier, we want to find the equation of the line in, in this case, two-dimensional, but multidimensional space that nicely divides the two groups. That, that is classification. Um, let's see if I need to run all this stuff. I wonder if that even makes a plot. That plot looks like that's the kilometer to mile thing, so I will just skip on. So here's a case where we have a separating line placed on our plot. And if I were to ask you, is that a useful separating line for separating caterpillars and ladybugs? If it's the only one you have, you'd use it. But you can clearly see that three times out of whatever the total number there is, it incorrectly classifies a bug. So we could try changing the slope of that line, and now we have a separating line that is arguably even more useless uh, because anything above it is classified as a bug, and anything below it is not bug. But eventually we come up with this separating line, which the beauty of drawing stuff is you can get awesome uh, results. Uh, and clearly anything above that goes into the red group, and anything below it goes into the group, blue group. And that is the essence of classification schemes, is how to draw that line to separate one or more groups or two or more groups of things. In this case, we only have two input variables, the length and the width. But in classification schemes, you can have more than just two. So now we have an unknown bug. You can tell it's an unknown bug. Why? Because it says unknown bug. Excellent. Very good. Um, what kind of bug is that unknown bug most likely to be? My word choice is careful. So. Caterpillar. So how did you come up with that? I agree with you. It's most likely to be a caterpillar. How did you come up with that statement? It's above the line. It's above the line. 
which implicitly means the probability of caterpillarness is close to one, or the probability of ladybugness is close to zero. Keep that in mind as we move on to um, logistic regression coming up on the guitar shortly. So, as before, we need to train our classifier. And we want to train it, which is simply to find the uh, slope of the line between it. So let's suppose we have a sample size of two, one ladybug and one caterpillar. So there's our two bugs. We could declare those the training set and come up with our favorite line between them. I use the error. There's a lot of uh, mumbo jumbo here in error adjustment. And follow that and eventually hopefully we get down to something like that. Okay, so this is a very simple training scheme and its purpose is really just to illustrate the idea of classification and training. It doesn't do a very good job because that particular classifier, if you look at the script, um, uses the last observation to go ahead and establish the training line, which is not the best way to do it. But that introduces us to our logistic regression. So let's say that that last line right there, y equals 1.6042x, is declared to be the classifier. Then we now can look at an unknown bug. And you know it's an unknown bug because it'll have a label on it that says unknown bug. And where it falls relative to that classifier line helps us determine whether to put it into the caterpillar or the a ladybug category. And this silly example is, is actually deeper than a lot of things. That's how the Internal Revenue Service de decides who to go out and shake down at, on April of every year. If your classifier puts you into that, they probably got money. We can go get it out of them, go shake them down. Um, Banks do it. Your credit card company does it to determine uh, if your card's being used fraudulently. Although they don't actually care if it's being used fraudulently. They care about getting paid and so forth. So this is not just an idle um, novelty at the end of your introduction to computational thinking class. Okay, let's look at a type of regression called logistic regression. And it's still regression in the usual sense. Um, but it's a good stepping point in the classification. When Matteo was able to declare the unknown bug a caterpillar, he did that because it was above the classification line, which restated means the probability that that bug was a caterpillar was high. Uh, logistic models do exactly that. They essentially assign a probability to an output. And if the probability is high, we, we can declare, well, it's pretty likely that, that, that it's a member of the one category, or pretty likely it's a member of the zero category. Naturally, the difficulty comes when it's somewhere in between, which if it's a real problem, it'll always be in between. OK, so let me read this to you all really fast. The logistic model is used, yeah, don't, don't even try. <laughs> The logistic model is used to model the probability of a certain class or event, such as pass, fail, win, lose, dead, alive, healthy, sick, green, red, caterpillar, ladybug. Um, and they actually can be extended to multiple classes, not just two. Each object detected uh, gets assigned a probability between 0 and 1 with everything adding up to one, and when we get done, we use that probability to determine what class something belongs to. Okay, so we'll skip through that. Oh, you would have thought I actually would have put the equations. If we go to Wikipedia, oh, it's not even going to ask me for money. <laughs> That's unusual. Um, there, there's the equation that we're after. So that unviewable equation. So here's an example of a logistic estimator that has two inputs, x1 and x2. 
length and width. It has some weights assigned to them, and it has an intercept. So to the right of that equal sign, what kind of equation does that look like to you? X1 and X2 are our observational inputs. Okay, <laughs> since you're all going invisible on me, pretend the 2 stuff isn't even there. Beta 0 plus beta 1 X1. What does that look like to you? Linear. A what? Linear. Linear, yeah, a straight line. And this, this is a two-dimensional line. Um, so let's suppose we know all those betas. We put the x1 and x2 in, and we can get a, an estimate of the probability of that output. Then we can um, convert it to a logarithmic odds ratio with the following conversion. And eventually, we get here they're switching to log base 10. Uh, the idea is we're going to use these output probabilities as the y part of the of, of a linear type regression to fit the internal parameters and then we have a tool to model our classification scheme. So let's go back to the classification scheme. The example I'm about to do I stole from this location. So I'm making sure that the uh, urls still work. So you get this logistic regression model in the end, you get either a happy or a sad penguin. And here they have a plot of what the, well, they're calling it the sigmoid activation function or the logistic function. So if we're at the mean value, it's, it's at the 50th percentile. So this function is conveying the same information that our probability estimation models did with the Weibull plotting position. If we're a long way from the mean or the median to the left of it, we get results that are very close to zero. If we're a long, long way, we're almost assuredly zero. And if we move to the right of it, we get results close to one. The rest of this blog post, which I recommend you look at so you'll understand what's going on in the accompanying script, is all this cryptic stuff get what I was looking for. Where is it? Right there. So here's here's the model that the uh, author is using. This Z value is the linear combination of inputs weighted by the various terms. It goes into the sigmoidal activation function to come up with a y hat and then the rest of it, this part, is pretty much a uh, least squares type of minimization. With the added bonus feature that because this step and that step are pretty nonlinear, you can't just use linear regression directly. And then the remainder of this describes the algorithm that we're just going to pretend, pretend works. And so we're going to load in NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlibrary, Seaborn, sklearn, and what we need in the uh, sklearn is the training tests, the standard scalar, and accuracy score. So let's just load those in. OK, claims it's done. Now I'm going to use a database called the IRIS database. And it's taken off the mighty internet. It's, it's just to the left of the wine database on the internet. I'm not sure left and right makes sense. And hopefully it's loaded locally to my machine. Because you'll notice, compared to other stuff, there's none of the get requests import. Uh, that's not here. Let's see if I was nice enough to even leave. Did I leave the database? Oh, that's kind of bad of me. Well, you, you can get it off the internet from this location right here. There's the iris data set. So let's read it and hope for the best. Okay, that so far so good. Let's go look at what the uh, head of the database looks like. And it has some rows in it. 
and one of the columns is called sepal length in centimeters. Uh, sepal is the length of a per certain part of the plant, and there's the sepal width in centimeters, and then the petal length and the petal width. So we have four inputs here, Se sepal and petal, length and width. And then of those, there's classifications of different types of flowers. So we have iris centosa, and there's another one, iris versicolor, I think, is the other one. Let's go ahead and describe the data frame. So it's not very big. It's got 145 um, entries that are non-null in the petal width, 150 in the other categories. has some mean values five number summary. So let's learn more about the actual uh, database. Um, our next step, if we're going to do proper data analysis, is the ones that don't have complete records, we need to wipe them because we can't make use of them. If we're going to use four input variables, we need to have records that have all four. So tossing out five of 150, that's Five percent. That's less than two percent of the total. That's probably not going to be a big deal, and so we'll go ahead and do that. And so, if you remember, we take the data frame. We're going to drop all the NAs from petal width, and now when we get left, we should have 145 of everything that's left. And the key thing we're looking for in this is non-null and the data type. You'll notice that sepal length width, petal length width are floats, and the classification is stored as an object, so it's a string. Now we're going to go ahead and use something called the pair plot, which you did in the concrete database, to see how things are related. First, because I don't want to get the pink rectangle of encouragement, I'm going to tell it to ignore the warnings. So if it has exceptions that cause the code to fail, it doesn't ignore those because it can't. But the ones that warn me that it's been deprecated and you didn't stand on your left foot when you press the button, we can suppress that. So now we're waiting on it to compute. And it's reading the database, I hope. I should draw a cool picture. There we go. Okay, so there is our uh, our pairwise uh, database. You've seen this before in the concrete stuff. The um, the diagonal one in and of itself isn't particularly useful. But what I'm looking at is if we look at the classification scheme, we have iris centosa, iris centosa with two s's, versicolor. Iris versicolor and Iris virginica. Um, the there's evidence from the orange and the red that those are possibly transcription mistakes, and so we can either remove them um, or modify them. We're going to modify them. Let's look at the uh, value counts. Yes, so we have five versicolor. One Sentosa with two S's, that's clearly a trans transcription mistake. And so we'll go ahead and correct those. So we're going to replace the one with two S's. Versicolor and Sentosa. I think that's an incorrect replacement, but we'll go ahead and run with it. Now we have Versicolor, Virginica, and Sentosa. And we are going to drop the Virginica one. There's a lot of it, so it could be indeed a different species, or it could be a transcription error. But let's just go ahead and drop it. So now we're down to two categories. They are, anyone remember? Who can guess what one of them is? Who can read what one of them is? Can't 
can't read that? Your eyes that bad? Oh, you you have an excuse. He doesn't. He's sitting right up front. Okay, very good. And then let's see what the other one is. What's the opposite of a head? Is a tail. Uh, the other one is iris versicolor. Now let's check for out-and-out -out liars. Uh, we're going to produce a another pair plot, which will look kind of the same, but it has fewer things in it, and it's going to still take it an eternity to do so. Okay, so there is our pair plot with the two categories we have left. We clearly have a collection of blue dots and a correct collection of what color is that to y'all? Looks like orange to me. Orange um, dots. And you can see in the uh, diagonal term, at least the first two elements, there's a fair amount of overlap in the uh, KDE kernel density estimators. Or you can think of it as, as a, a pseudo probability density function. There's good separation in this one good separation in this one. So if we were actually going to reduce our uh, input variable count from 4 to 2, we could ditch these two and just base everything on the right two categories. But the other important part is this vertical line of dots right here, which should have its mirror of a horizontal line of dots right there. And those don't seem to fit in with the rest of the data at all. So we sometimes give those the name outliers, unless it's statistics and they're out and out liars. Um, so let's, uh, so sepal width and sepal length seem to have a collection of outliers. There's only one, two, three, it looks like there's only five the biggest one only has five of these outliers. So we'll, we'll go look and see how to deal with that in a second. So let's do a histogram of it. And there is the histogram of sepal length. So given that all the data are supposed to kind of be like each other, where would you say the outliers appear to be? Yeah, you know, way off to the left. That that blue bar off to the left. We want to make it go away. So what we'll do is we will take everything whose sepal length is less than one and toss it out, and then keep everything that's left, and we'll call that the final data frame. So we will go ahead and make those changes. That's what these two lines do. And now that is our histogram that we're going to use for a classification model. And what that histogram is telling us, obviously we can get an average from it if we wanted to, but everything's kind of staying next to each other. So that, that is suggestive that the outliers have been removed for that. If we play the same game with width, Well, actually, we're just going to do the pair plot again and see if those five dots went away. They will have, unless it doesn't plot. No oddball lines of dots in either horizontal or vertical axis. And here we have really nice separation in the petal length versus petal width. So if we only had to use... Um, just two things. We could run a line there. We can draw a line right there pretty good. One right there. A stupid line right there. One right there. Maybe squeeze one through right there. So we've got a lot of uh, visual separation. We should be able to build a classifier for this. Okay, so our logistic regression scheme while it can identify things that are going to go into category one or two, the categories have to be integers, either a zero or a one. 
it cannot handle directly the uh, strings. So we're going to take iris centosa and iris versicolor and replace them with 1 and 0 respectively. So we're now destroying our data frame, but remember it's a copy of the original data frame, so we can always recover. So we make those replacements, and now instead of those um, strings, we have zeros and ones. And the tail is just going to have a column of zeros. But we will verify that. Okay, so now we have our stuff. Actually, I'm curious to see what would happen if I do that. If I just refresh the data frame, I'm going to go ahead and replot it. See what happens. I don't think the, the plot shouldn't change appearance. I'm just curious what the uh, how it's going to label things, or maybe it's just going to break. Yeah, the the only difference is the class now changes from those strings to zeros and ones. So blue are zeros, oranges are ones. So our data frame is ready. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is start to build a model, a data model, for the purpose of trying to draw that separator line. So we're going to have a object called an input data frame, another object called the output data frame. The input data frame is going to take um, column 4, which would be those zeros and ones. And the output data frame is going to take columns 0 through 3, which are the four different predictors. We're going to use a scalar function, and we're going to take the input data frame, we're going to transform it using the scalar, which is to get everything in the correct scale, all the same size, and that's going to become our new input data frame. And then we're going to go through and split the data frame into a testing component and a training component. So the training is where we're adjusting slopes. The testing is where we see how good it did. And there's nothing to see here when I run output. It just runs. So if you go to that blog post, uh, this is what's in the blog post. But if you attempt to run it on, at least on my version of Jupyter, it doesn't run. I get the pink rectangle of encouragement that actually has non-meaningful uh, error messages. So it turns out that that method is deprecated. So my next idea was, well, let me just copy the syntax of the other two because it's coding. Maybe that should work. And that kind of runs partway down the sheet, but then it fails later. Turns out that that is what you would have to do to get it to have the right structure. And that is a lesson that you all probably have picked up already. But when you're copying stuff off the internet, look at the date that it was created. Because if it's more than a year or two old, it's likely got broken stuff. And that doesn't mean not to use it, but you may, you're going to have to provide the intellect to fix the broken stuff. So let me go ahead and run that. And now we're going to just look at the shapes of the arrays. So our input is 75 uh, rows with four columns, and our output is 19 rows with four columns. And we're going to use that to start building a model. So we're looking for now those weights, those beta 1, beta 2, beta 0 in the linear equation that's going to get fed to the sigmoidal activation function and we need to initialize those. And so a, a good thing to start with is just make everything zero and see what happens. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's done. Here's our sigmoidal activation function. Not very exciting. It's, it's 1 over 1 plus the exponent of the input. So we'll load that function in. And now is the tricky part. We're going to have uh, an optimizer that uses, let me see if I can find it, uses the activation function and 
performs a cost minimization. And so it, it does that. It's very similar to a least squares fitting step. Only unlike that, it's going to do it multiple times. So there's our optimizer. And finally, here's where it goes through uh, the prediction. So once we have the weights and the intercept, we can predict outputs. So there's our prediction tool. Finally, the actual predict function. And now the, uh, the real work. Let's slow this. Let's go real short right now. So what this is going to do, this is that part where it's going to make a guess. It's going to predict the output. It's going to compare that predicted output to the observations and decide if it's good enough or not. If it's not, it's going to change the guess and do it again. Change the guess and do it again. And in this case, we're limiting it to try it 600 times. And then the learning rate is how much we allow the guess to change between each time. So we'll run that. And that, and our, you can think of our cost function is how far away from correctness we are. And in this case, it did 600 guesses. And we went, went from 0.69 to 0.66. And if we were to, um, let's just go ahead and do this. So these are numbers that are actually in the database. And let's put something that's close. So here we have classification zero. Here's a set of numbers that are almost the same ones, 2.8. OK, so a good classifier is if you put a number that's in its database, you should get the correct classification. We do that, and it says there's a 48% probability that that, that that particular category is a 1. Um, so that's less than a half, so you might correctly conclude it's a zero. Uh, but that's kind of telling me that our classifier isn't completely built yet. So let's crank up 600,000. I don't want to, it takes a long time to run because it's got to do all these things. And so now it's found the four features. Features is just a fancy data science word for variable or um, prediction variable. And it's still running. And you know you're doing real data science and engineering if when you hit the run button you have to get up and go get a cup of coffee or maybe take an airplane to another city and spend a long weekend there. When you come back, maybe it's done. I would go ahead and attempt to run the plot, but I don't want to crash it. So awkward silence. <laughs> no, it's it's actually running. I happen to know that it takes a long time to run. Maybe six hundred thousand wasn't nice, <laughs> but. Yeah, I don't want to restart the kernel because I want it to get done. So while it's still running, I want you to kind of commit that number to memory and we'll put it up on the board. So our first attempt was 600 trials. So like, like bootstrapping, it uses the same data over and over again. Our uh, prediction was 0.49. And remember that the truth for that one should be close to zero. OK, so do we have output, or is it still? All right, so it's now done its thing. Let's now plot our. OK, now that's, that's what we like to see. We, we now have our later uh, iterations are pretty close to zero. We're going to go with this. And if we go ahead and run that, hopefully I get the 
weights correct? Is it coming out of W? Yeah. That point four eight, I would have thought better than point two two, but it's clearly well away from a half, and it's closer to the side. So we would likely correctly interpret that classification. Now, if you don't want to write your own code, who does? I don't. Um, we can use the logistic regression tool that's already built into sklearn. And so we'll do that. And we're still going to use the same data that we've already built. We have a training array and we have a testing array. So I think I already built that. So we'll go ahead and fit it, print it. And it claims our sklearn accuracy is 1. So it's, it's, it's a really good predictor. And now we will, those are the same numbers. This should be a 2.8 and 5.7. We're going to put numbers that are actually in the database. So when we run that, actually uh, the professionally written one and our home built are pretty close. But you notice the professionally written one was substantially faster. So there's nothing wrong with using uh, professionally written stuff. So at this point, if these were indeed our input measurements, our probability comes out as a 0.21. Would you conclude that this is a type 1 or a type 0 plant? The probability of it being 1 is 0.2. The probability of it being 0 would be 0.8, so it's a type 0, which, which is indeed correct in this particular case. And that's the essence of classification. Now, if you go check these various web links out, uh, you will immediately discover that every single one of them leaves off the end part of how to use the thing that you just built. So bear that in mind when you uh, copy other people's work is for some reason, I don't understand it, but these are all coming out of uh, data science bad word, um, data science classes. Um, for some reason, they leave off the most important aspect of the tool that we as engineers care about. Okay, so now I've classified it. I want to put my unknown ladybug into the classifier and know what kind of bug it is. I I guess that their thinking is you should be able to figure that out on your own, so we're not going to tell you. Okay, so hopefully it will restart, although I actually am... So bear that in mind that um, many of the things don't actually tell you how to access the model. They do this testing set to see how good the model is, but if you look at how a testing is run, let me get the... That was not horribly useful. Although in this case, it actually does the prediction for you, whether it's a zero or a one. All right, any questions? I mean, that was a brief introduction to classification. Keep in mind that classification could be a two or three semester course in the hands of computer scientists. You throw some statistics in and you would come out with your head spinning thinking that business school doesn't look so bad after all. Um, but the essence is we're taking input information and using that to make a decision of what class something belongs to. It's not the same as, it has similarities to a hypothesis testing, whether it's the same or different population, and, and probably leverages some features of that. But it's, it's literally taking input uh, variables and using that to uh, estimate uh, the class that it belongs to. We actually have a little bit of time today, so let's go take a look at your lab coming up. 22. Why doesn't that have the new? Okay, so here is your lab coming up, and there's a thing I need to click on to make it go away. So this one has a lot of pictures and stuff in it. 
So the lab is, what we've just done today is looked at those two pictures right there. Regression, we're trying to put a line through a cloud of data and use that line to predict things. Classification, we're trying to put a line through a cloud of data and use that line to decide whether stuff is green or blue. Logistic regression is the first of many techniques to do that classification. And oh, here's the one that has all the equations in it. You've seen this function already. And what a logistic regression is trying to do is we have a collection of zeros, a collection of ones, and it's trying to pass this S-curve through it the best way possible. And where the challenge comes is when we have stuff that's kind of right on the S-curve. The middle is the 50th percentile, and so we have to decide how far away from the median is 0 and 1. And you'll do an example with a database called the Diabetes Database, and it's, it looks like the link is correct. And if you take a look at all this script, you'll see it's very much like um, what I've just done. Pretty pictures, though, you have to admit. Because if you can't understand something, then by all means, use pretty pictures. Because maybe you will deceive your, uh, your end user. And then uh, you'll be introduced to something called a confusion matrix, which you have to admit is a really good name for something. Um, talks about this is very much an extension of our type 1 and type 2 error, but now we're in a more complicated world. And confusion matrix is a good name because it's got all these different blocks as blocks that can be evaluated. And ultimately, we want to get down to this four category thing where we detect if it's true, we detect a positive yay. If it's um, true, and we detect a negative also yay. And we want to avoid the false results. Okay, I th think this will be a good quitting time. We'll see you in lab in a little bit. And you have an exam on Thursday. Same format as before. Topics will be, what have we done since last exam? Hypothesis tests, various kinds of regressions, some kind of classification. So pay attention to lab today. All right, you are all free to go. Time. Yep. Okay. And are we having lab on Thursday? No. Thank you.